epidemiology unit. Um, just a distraction for a moment. Continue, record, right, continue. Um, and uh, and now he's spending some time in Cambridge working with uh, Ching Wan Zhao at the Stats Lab. He's, uh, he has various uh, diverse interests, including Mendelian randomization, selection bias, and uh, genomics for drug discovery. And today he's talking about uh, work on selection bias. Matt, go ahead. Okay, uh, yeah, thanks very much for the introduction. Um, so yes, this is a joint work with my supervisors back at Bristol and also Ching Wan uh, here in Cambridge. Um, and it's, it's, it's one of my PhD papers, uh, the first one I started working on and um, hopefully the second one that will end up being published. So this is called Sample Constrained Partial Identification with Application to Selection Bias. Um, so sort of a, a quick overview of the talk. It's, it's going to start out quite technical and then become progressively less technical. So I'm going to start out describing kind of the general problem that we were concerned with, which is stochastic optimization when we have to estimate the constraints um, in our sort of optimization problem. Uh, I'm then going to describe how that can be applied to a sensitivity analysis for selection bias and then work through two examples. So one is on the effect of education on income in UK Biobank and the others is on uh, risk factors for COVID-19 among those who have been tested for COVID-19. But both of these are in UK Biobank. So I'm kind of giving a talk in reverse of how this paper actually unfolded. It started out as what I thought would be something quite simple, uh, sort of taking, ex taking sort of existing ideas for sensitivity analyses for selection bias and then incorporating external information on the population. Um, but I, I ended up realizing that uh, in order to conduct statistical inference, I, I needed to treat this as a stochastic optimization problem. And, and the theory for doing that with sample constraints wasn't quite developed enough. So I had to go and do that and then go back to the selection bias problem. Okay, um, I, I had a who am I slide, but Sean covered it all pretty, pretty well. So I'll just skip over that. Um, yeah, so, so, so to start off with uh, sort of what is partial Matt, identity? Matt, yes. You didn't mention everything. There were things on that slide that you didn't mention, like your internship. Oh yeah, sorry, I forgot that one. So at, at the moment, I'm I'm staying in Cambridge in the statistics in the stats lab with Ching Wan. Um, but at the moment, and until about April, I'm working full time at a startup called Relation Therapeutics in London, and they're sort of trying to use trying to sort of combine machine learning and Mendelian randomization for uh, for drug discovery and age related diseases. So that's been quite interesting because I'm not a I'm not a biologist or geneticist by training. My background's in economics, so I've kind of been thrown thrown in the deep end on that one. But it, it, it's been really interesting. Um, yeah. So in terms of sort of what is partial identification? So the the basic idea here is that sometimes we're we're only really willing to make assumptions on the observable data that will allow us to identify a set or an interval in which our parameter of interest lies. Um, a, a classical example of this comes from Mansky 2003, uh, and uh, Chuck Mansky has done a lot of work on partial identification problems. So we, we might think that we have some discrete random variable y, uh, and we have an indicator s which tells us whether a particular value of y is observed or not. Um, the distribution of y can certainly be decomposed into its sort of observable part, probability of y given s equals one, and its unobservable part, probability of y given s equals zero. Um, and, and the basic idea here is that I don't know anything about the probability of y given s equals zero, it's unobserved. Well, I know it lies between zero and one, but that's about it. So th the best I can say about the, the overall probability of y is that it, it should certainly lie between the values implied by probability of y given s equals zero being zero and also being equal to one. So the smallest value it could take is this, is you know when I set the unobserved part equal to zero and the largest value is when I set it equal to one. And this kind of characterizes an, an interval that I'm sure the probability of y lies between for a particular value of y. 
Um, so stochastic optimization problems are, are, can often be formulated in a very similar way. So these typically take the following form. So we have some function Q uh, and a set of parameters theta um, of, of dimension P. So Q, Q just maps the parameters to the real line. And what I'm interested in is the, the smallest value of Q over some set capital theta. And I'll, I'll call this value nu. Um, so we could we could write the missing data problem in this way, where Q of theta is equal to you know, the observable part of Y plus theta, which is the unobserved, um, the unobserved distribution times probability that S equals zero. Uh, and you know that this is minimized uh, when theta equals zero, and it's maximized when theta is equal to one. So this is a you know this I can also think of this as a kind of optimization problem. So stochastic optimization problems they're concerned with the setting where I don't observe Q of theta. Um, instead, I observe some estimator Q n of theta, where where n observe n denotes the sample size. And the, the field of stochastic optimization is concerned with the behavior of this object nu of n, which is the, the infimum of the estimator over this set, capital theta. Oh, oh and I, I should mention, um, if at any point you have any questions, I'm sure, I'm sure there's some way to, to raise your hand or just interrupt or something, I, I really don't mind. Um, yeah, so, so stochastic optimization generally concerned with this object. Um, and what we're concerned with in this paper is, is sort of the slightly more difficult setting where the set that I'm optimizing over, capital theta, also needs to be estimated empirically. So we consider a setting where this capital theta is characterized by some inequality constraints. So I'm going to say capital theta is equals the set of theta such that some, some set of functions, some a uh, set of J functions is less than or equal to zero. Um, and sort of similar to the, uh, the general stochastic optimization problem, I don't actually observe these functions H, J. I only observe some corresponding estimators, H, N of J. And these estimators could be arbitrarily correlated uh, with the estimator Q, N. Um, so that's, that's the general setting that I'm considering in this paper, or at least in the first part of this paper. And our goal in general is to provide statistical inference for nu, which is just to remind you the, the infimum of Q over capital theta, where of course I'm now having to estimate Q and I'm having to estimate capital theta. So in particular, what we wanna do is provide a lower confidence bound CN for any value of alpha, so that you know, the probability of that Cn is less than or equal to nu is bounded from below by one minus alpha as n becomes large. So that's so for the first part of the paper, that's what we're trying to do. Um, we, we just want to come up with this confidence interval. Um, so what do we currently know about this? So there has been some work done, e even on the setting where the constraints have to be estimated. Um, but to start off with, when theta is known and fixed, so of, of fixed dimension. Um, this quite influential paper by Shapiro back in 1991 essentially showed that under some not too crazy conditions, we can apply a functional delta method uh, to, to provide, uh, essentially showing that this new n is going to, um, that we can set up a central limit theorem for this. Uh, and that's gonna allow us to do statistical inference quite nicely. Um, when theta needs to be estimated, there, as I mentioned, there has been some work done on this as well. Most of this work, or yeah, pretty much all of this work centers that I've been able to find, I should qualify, uh, focuses on uh, what are called sample average approximations. So this is the case where this function Q of theta is the expected value of some function F um, and random variable X. And the, uh, the sample analog Q of n is just the average of this f at some value of theta. And we, we assume that x1 to xn are just independent draws of some x. So in this setting, Shapiro, the same paper, 
also established a central limit theorem for this object, which is the infimum of Qn over the, uh, the estimated set. So, so this is basically just replacing um, these hj's with the hjn's. I, I think I didn't introduce the notation for theta n. But yeah, th theta n is just replacing the hj's with the hjn's. So he provides a central limit theorem for this object. Um, but it, it has some pretty strong requirements, which didn't certainly weren't going to hold in the setting that I was considering. Um, first of all, I was considering objects a little bit more complex than sample averages. Um, and also he, he requires that F, uh, sort of the, the function that we're averaging over and the constraints, which are also characterized by expected values, all of these need to be um, convex in theta. And a constraint qualification has to hold so that the optimal value lies in the interior of uh, capital theta. Um, so there has to be an interior solution and basically everything has to be convex and a sample average. Um, and I, I was considering constraints where I knew ahead of time that the optimal value was gonna lie on the boundary. So this, this wasn't, a central limit theorem wasn't really, it, it didn't seem, at least I wasn't able to, to generalize this to, to come up with one. So I got a little bit stuck at that point. Um, but the, it, it's sort of worth what, what provided a bit of insight was characterizing what the, what the issue was, um, sort of why these assumptions are really needed. Um, and the, the real, the core issue is that in general, you know, without these convexity and interior solution assumptions, it's possible that the true parameter space and the estimated parameter space can have an empty intersection with probability one, even as n goes off to infinity. You know, there's no particular need that these things should overlap. And the, the issue with this is that, of course, the true parameter lies inside, you know, or the, the true optimal solution lies inside capital theta. Um, and I'm basically saying that, that the true optimal solution could lie inside my estimated theta never. Um, which means I'm I'm never going to get I'm never going to converge to the correct solution. So, one you know what what can we do about this if if a central limit theorem seems kind of hard to to develop? Well, one really simple idea is just to kind of relax theta n a bit, just make it a bit bigger, uh, and make it bigger in such a way that I know I know the probability that it will contain the true parameter space. So what, what we essentially proposed is that if theta n is equal to this uh, set of inequality constraints, uh, the uh, HNJs, then what we're saying is let's just replace the zero here with some strictly positive sequence of epsilons um, so that this, this relaxed set, what, what I call theta n r, is just kind of making it's just a little bit bigger. I'm just adding some positive value epsilon onto this set to expand it a bit. And in, in a lot of cases, I can choose this epsilon in such a way that I know the probability that theta is going to lie inside of this relaxed set. Um, so I'm, I'm going to choose it, choose this sequence of epsilons um, so that this probability is bounded from below by one minus alpha one, which is some value that I can pick. So we can essentially just think of this relaxed set as a confidence set for the parameter space. Um, and there's there's a there's quite a big literature on how you can construct these kinds of things. Uh, a lot of work done in econometrics, and there's pretty there's even simpler ways than that if you're willing to be a bit more conservative. So this. This thing isn't too difficult to construct. Um, one, once I have it, um, we're sort of pretty close to being done. So I'll introduce just a little bit of extra notation to, to formally describe what our confidence bound ended up looking like. So once I have this relaxed set, theta nr, essentially what I can do is find the optimal solution, qn, over this relaxed set. Um, so this is, of course, going to be strictly less than the optimal solution over theta n. 
because these I'm assuming these these epsilons that I've added, you know, I'm, I'm basically just making the parameter space a bit bigger, or I shouldn't say strictly less than, weak, weakly less than. Um, so I can solve this thing. And then assuming that I have an estimator for the variance of QN, uh, I can essentially construct a confidence bound that's pretty, it, it sort of looks like the confidence bound I would construct if I had a central limit theorem for, for this object. So I'm gonna say, my confidence bound is equal to the function at the minimum over my relax set minus some uh, sort of critical value at uh, alpha two, some, some alpha two level that I pick, you know, times the standard deviation divided by square root 10. Um, so that's a pretty standard confidence interval. If I, you know, if, if I knew exactly, if, sort of, if I knew what theta was, you know, if theta was was fixed, and I uh, solved for for this optimal solution, this var theta over it, then this is the confidence interval that I would construct. So we, we can sort of think of this as the confidence interval treating theta n r as fixed and true, and I I know what it is. Um, it ends up being it was surprisingly non-trivial to prove, but it is possible to, from here, prove that this confidence bound CN is going to cover the true infimum with probability at least one minus alpha one minus alpha two. Um, so we can pick you know, our, our overall alpha level to be alpha one plus alpha two, and then we have sort of the confidence bound I where did I introduce it? This, this one at the bottom of this slide, we, we have this confidence bound that I was trying to get at the beginning. Um, yeah, so that was kind of a whirlwind tour through that, that bit of the paper. Uh, as, as I mentioned, this, this is really just about setting up a, a principled way of doing statistical inference for these kinds of stochastic optimization problems, which the sensitivity analysis for selection bias that we're interested in, it ends up this, this is kind of the correct way of formulating it. Um, so we needed to have some, some meaningful way of doing statistical inference for these kinds of problems. Um, and that, that didn't quite exist at the outset. So one, one final remark to make before I get on with the, the actual selection bias bit is that often uh, we're interested in a two-sided analog of this, um, this problem. So up to this point, I focused just on inference for this, for the infimum nu, um, but partial identification problems, we, we're usually trying to find both a lower bound and an upper bound for the quantity that we're interested in. So this can often be characterized by some interval i, uh, where q of var theta l is the solution for the minimum and q of var theta u is the solution for the maximum of q. Um, and this, it doesn't take too much to generalize this to a um, to this kind of setting. So we can choose our relaxed set so that the parameter space lies inside of it with probability one minus alpha one over two. Um, and then we can construct a two-sided confidence interval for i by essentially taking the, the, the lower confidence bound for the infimum along with the upper confidence bound for the supremum. Um, and this this will certainly cover I with probability, again, at least one minus alpha one minus alpha two in the limit. So that's, um, so whenever you see a confidence interval, once I get to the data analysis bit, uh, this this is the confidence interval that I'm, that I'm writing out. Okay, um, I get, I'll stop here for just a second to see if there are any questions. You said it, it's gonna be in chat. Uh, well, some people I think can raise their hands, others can't, but there, are, there don't seem to be any questions at the moment. Okay, good. Uh, I'll just, I'll move on then. Okay, so yeah, that, that was the, yeah, this kind of quite theoretical bit. Um, now, what, what we were really interested in at the outset, as I mentioned, was trying to come up with a way, a kind of a, a principled sensitivity analysis for sample selection bias, in particular in settings where um, estimating inverse probability weights, for example, isn't possible. So I'll get into that now. So many, um, yeah, as, as I'm sure you're aware, many statistical analyses begin by 
selecting a study sample from some population. Um, and an issue can arise when this sample is drawn non-randomly from that population, then inference back to that population is no longer guaranteed. Uh, sort of the statistics that we're estimating can be distorted by, uh, by different sort of forms of selection. So one pretty popular approach for, for dealing with this is inverse probability weighting. And the basic idea behind this is to take observations Sort of if I knew each observation's probability prior to being selected of being selected, then I could take the observations that I was pretty unlikely to see, and I got quite lucky to see them, and I can upweight them relative to, or upweight them more than observations that I was pretty likely to see. Um, and in this way, I kind of noisily reconstruct the, the population distribution for the, the quantities that I'm interested in. But sort of directly estimating these inverse probability weights, this requires data on uh, non-selected observations. This will often be limited or completely absent. Um, so that estimation is difficult. We, we might be restricted to quite to estimating quite poor quality weights, maybe with just a few uh, common demographic variables. Um, or, or we might not be able to estimate the weights at all. There, there are other approaches which what I'm describing is related to, such as balancing weights, where we essentially construct weights to balance observable characteristics between the, the sample and the population. Um, and you know that's that's possible. That that has certain limitations as well, in that we we might often be restricted to um, constructing these weights based on sort of marginal distributions, whereas maybe there are complex interactions or, or nonlinear terms in, in the selection model. Um, so but so as set, setting that aside, in, in this kind of setting where you know I want to estimate inverse probability weights, um, but I'm not able to because I, the data isn't available, there do exist um, some sensitivity analyses, which essentially assess the sensitivity of our estimates to um, a range of plausible inverse probability weights. So I might take a range of, of weights that I think could occur uh, and then find you know, the worst case and the, the worst case lower bound and the worst case upper bound for my estimates. Uh, and the, these sort of exist, well, they do exist, um, but there are some difficulties with them that I think have kind of limited their uptake in practice. So what, what I have here are the, the two that I think are probably most important. Um, th these are the ones that we address in the paper. So the first, and this is what I, I think is the most important, is that they're often very conservative. So one, once I allow some small variation in the weights, this can typically lead to a very wide range of estimates that will often include the null. Essentially, I, I can go very quickly to quite extreme weights that will, um, you know, ca cause my estimates to blow up in in some direction. Uh, the the second issue, which is also important, is that for many of these sensitivity analyses, certainly the two that I mentioned, uh, there aren't any procedures for conducting statistical inference alongside them. So we basically have to choose between, you know, constructing confidence intervals for sampling variability. And constructing these, these sort of these intervals for selection uncertainty, um, we we would ideally like to combine them so that we have a kind of a full interval that encompasses both, but these these procedures don't uh, don't necessarily exist. So the the observation that started us off uh, is that the the extreme weights that are often that are that are implied sort of at the boundaries of these sensitivity analyses, they're often inconsistent with known characteristics of the population. So for example, I, I might know in my population, which may be in the UK, that the proportion of males is about 50% overall. Um, but it could be that at the boundaries of these sensitivity analyses, the, the, these weights are implying a proportion of males of 30% or 70%, um, you know, really, really extreme values that I know shouldn't be true. So the, the idea is again really quite simple, which is that if I could if I could 
sort of tell the sensitivity analysis, I only want to consider weights which imply this known characteristic of my population, um, then this should tight, uh, tighten the range of estimates. You know, I, I should get a smaller interval um, for, for values that my estimate could take. Because I'm, I'm kind of, I'm ruling out a bunch of weights that I know shouldn't be true. Uh, and then one, you know, sort of I'm including this information. And then what I'm going to propose is to use the inference procedure I described you know, at the beginning of the talk to, to do statistical inference for this kind of problem. Um, okay, so to, I'll formalize this a little bit. So we're, so we're gonna consider a, an IID sample of size N, which has been drawn from some infinite population. And I'm going to, just like the missing data example, I'm going to assume that I have some indicator. And what this tells me is whether individual, some individual I enrolls in the sample uh, when S equals one, or they don't when S equals zero. And so that I end up with an observed sample size of little n. So we, we could think of big N as kind of the group of people who were invited to participate in a sample. You know, they, they were all, as in the case of UK Biobank, they were all sent letters or something. Um, and maybe only some proportion N of them actually respond. So I'm gonna assume without loss of generality that the first uh, little n indicators are equal to one and the rest are equal to zero. So the selection model that I'm going to consider is, I, I'm gonna say with sort of within my observed sample, I observe some vector of variables that are related to sample selection. I call these W. And in particular, I'm, I'm going to assume that sample selection only depends on these variables W that I observe within my sample. So, so the, the probability of selecting into the sample depends on W and this takes some function, which is governed by uh, a true parameter theta star. And in, in this sensitivity analysis, I assume that this follows a logistic model uh, there's nothing too special about the logistic model apart from um, it gives the sensitivity parameters. I'll introduce in the next slide quite a nice interpretation in terms of uh, odds ratios. But really, this could this could be any function. It could be a union of functions. Um, that I don't I don't really use the properties of of this in in the actual method. Okay, so so but I I, I am going to assume at least that for the function that I do pick, it is correct. Um, so the, the issue, as I mentioned, is that I don't observe theta star. I've got no way of estimating it because I'm, I'm assuming I don't know anything about people for whom s equals zero. So um, in terms of what's already out there, there's a paper by Thompson and Ara back in 2014. They consider the same setting as this. And what they propose is basically to select parameters for the weight model uh, based on domain knowledge or to just enumerate a large number of possible parameters and check how variable the estimates end up being. Um, and this is this can be sort of challenging to implement when selection mechanism is complicated or maybe we, we don't have a lot of domain knowledge about what's driving selection. What we thought would make maybe a little bit more sense is to is to frame this sort of as, as an optimization problem over a space of parameters that we think are plausible. And then we find the worst case lower bound and the worst case upper bound of our estimate. So I'm, I'm going to assume just to make the exposition easier that all the WIKs have mean zero and standard deviation one. And essentially what we're going to do is choose uh, sensitivity parameters, uh, lambda zero L, lambda zero U and lambda one. So that the sort of the, the odds of uh, of selection for a, for a one standard deviation increase in each variable is bounded between lambda one and one over lambda one. Um, I, I assume that these lambda ones don't depend on K uh, because K or the, the, there could be a very large number of parameters, but you could pick these on a variable by variable basis if you wanted to. Um, and then I'm going to assume that the intercept term theta zero the sort of the, the odds of selection for the average individual in the sample, these are also bounded between two parameters that I pick. So uh, once I've once I pick these parameters, and you know I can make these quite large if I want to be 
conservative or quite small if maybe I have more information about some variables than others. Uh, it's still, it's somewhat related, it, it still can be difficult in the same way that I guess the Thompson and our paper is difficult in that we have to have some sense of what's reasonable. Um, but we don't have to, once we pick these three values, we don't need to enumerate over all sort of all possible combinations. Um, we're, we're going to solve an optimization problem. So we can convert this into a parameter space, capital theta. So this is just taking it from being in terms of uh, odds into being in terms of log odds, uh, the thetas directly. And then from here, what we're gonna say is I have some, I have some estimate beta n theta. I, I won't write this out explicitly just to kind of avoid banging you over the head with too much notation. But the basic idea here is that this beta n is some inverse probability weighted estimator. It could be uh, a, a parameter from a linear regression or two stage least squares. Um, and it, it's inverse weighted by weights for some value of theta that I pick. So the weights take this, this same form, this logistic form uh, of in terms of W, but you know, I, I don't know what theta star is, so I, I pick some value of theta. Um, and that's going to imply a certain value of my estimate. And I'm going to assume that beta theta without the n, this is the corresponding estimate. So we can just think of this as sort of what beta n converges to as n becomes very large. And I, I'm going to assume that this limit exists, of course. So the, the optimization problem can basically be written as uh, you know, if if I know what theta is, up to now I know exactly what theta is, it's fixed. So I'm in the setting of kind of existing work on stochastic optimization. So I can just, I can take the infimum of beta n over my parameter space, uh, and I can do this, you know, hypothetically I could do the same for the true estimand, beta theta. Uh, and the, the basic idea is that, um, if the true parameter theta star lies inside the parameter state space that I pick, then certainly this lower bound nu is going to is going to lower bound the true estimate. Um, and I can I can estimate that, and because theta is fixed, I know that this is going to have a central limit theorem from some existing results, uh, and I can construct nice confidence intervals for this for this object. So, so up, up to now, that's pretty straightforward and it, it follows from work that's already out there. But as I mentioned earlier on, what we were really hoping to do with this is start including some stuff that we know about the population. Uh, so one, so, so for example, you know, this, this is a, a pretty simple one. I might know covariate means. So I, I might know that for some, you know, some variable WK uh, in, my, in my weight model, um, or that you know this this doesn't have to be in my weight model. It can be any variable really. Um, I know the population mean of it. Then I know that the true inverse weighted mean of W I K should equal this in expectation. So kind of rearranging a little bit, I can write this as a constraint H uh, N J, and this is basically saying that you know the, the the inverse weighted sample mean of WIK shouldn't be too far away from this expected value of WIK that I, that I know about my population. Uh, and this sort of this expression to the right of the inequality sign, you know, with the, the Z alpha one J over two and the standard deviation and everything, that's, that corresponds to the, um, th this is a choice of epsilon Remember these, uh, the, this sort of sequence of epsilons that I use to relax, to relax the constraint set. Uh, one, one choice that I could pick, I mentioned that this basically corresponds to a confidence interval for the set. So, um, uh, where was I? So one, uh, yeah, one obvious value I, I can pick is just the kind of, uh, just the sort of a, a confidence interval for this constraint. Um, and I can do this, you know, basically, as long as this auxiliary information can be formulated as a statistical test, it has a known null distribution, 
um, it can be placed within this framework. Uh, so there, we consider some other examples in the paper. So, you know, for example, if if I know the response rate of of a, a survey-based sample um, in UK Biobank, this was 5.5%, then it's possible to show that the expected value of the inverse weights in the sample should be equal to one over this response rate. And I can formulate that as a very similar kind of constraint. Um, I might also know that two variables uh, should be uncorrelated in the population. Uh, an example of this that came out recently in, in Nature Genetics was a paper showing that um, if you perform a, a genome-wide association study of biological sex on autosomal variants in UK Biobank and some other samples, you will find significant associations that shouldn't exist in the population because um, the, the, the autosomes and the sex chromosomes segregate independently. And so that, but so I, I, might, I, I should know, okay, that, that independence should exist in the population. I might want to, again, in, ensure that, that, that any weights that I'm considering imply that. Um, that, that might be quite useful in, in genetic studies. And then there has been some other work, for example, if I know quantiles of certain variables or even the shape of the distribution, um, I could, you know, formulate these as uh, Kolmogorov's Mianov tests or, you know, something and, and add that into the constraint set as well. So these are the, the, the restriction that you might have picked up on is, is really to do with uh, computation. So it can, these you know, you add a very complicated set of constraints, solving the optimization problem can be difficult sometimes. Uh, I've, the, the, the package that we have up um, on GitHub does, does some things to make this a little bit easier, but it's, it's essentially a brute force approach. Um, but for, for certain problems, you, you might be able to get some nice theoretical results as well. Uh, yeah, so so that's that's kind of the the idea behind the method. As I mentioned, we're kind of it's taking a, an existing sort of sensitivity analysis and figuring out how to add in stuff that we know about the population to make it more informative, and then showing that we can also do valid statistical inference on that resulting uh, interval. Um, so we we don't have to do the two separately. So I'll, I'll kind of I'll round off with a couple of examples that I mentioned at the beginning. So the, the first one, this is the one that we have in the paper. So this is the effect of education on income in, in UK Biobank. And this is a replication of a paper by uh, Davies and colleagues back in 2018. Um, so the basic idea here is that we might be interested in the effect of remaining in school until the age of 16 on your likelihood of earning a certain amount of money per year in adulthood. This, this 31,000 pounds is picked because that's how it's measured in, in UK Biobank. It's measured in sort of chunks. Um, and we're, we're a little bit worried that the, the corresponding observation association might be confounded. So what this paper did was they, they took a, an instrumental variable approach. There was an educational reform that took place in England in 1972, which basically raised the school leaving age. Uh, I think it, was it, my, was it from 15 to 16? I think it was. Uh, and the, the idea was that people who, so, some people might have just been affected by that reform and had to remain in school. And some people might have just avoided it and not had to remain in school. So considering individuals just on either side of being affected by the reform should ideally be sort of a source of, of semi-random variation in, in how likely people were to remain in school. Um, and what, what we're concerned with in this case is we, we know that UK Biobank participants, they differ systematically from the rest of the UK population on a lot of measures, including education and income, along with stuff like health status, age, geographical location. There's been a lot written about this kind of thing. Um, so we, we, we want to kind of try to do something about uh, the, the selection issue in this analysis. Um, they, I, I think in the appendix maybe of the original paper, they did some simple inverse weighting where they computed kind of averages of uh, education, sort of time probability of selection given education status from the census. Uh, but we, we wanna do something a little bit more detailed. 
So what I'm going to propose is, uh, and this uh, this da this data model, this um, the first two points are just replicating the original paper. So I'm going to consider a UK biobank subsample of individuals born between 1971 and 1973, so each a year out from being affected by the reform, and then condition on the month of birth to kind of control for uh, seasonality, I guess. Um, and what I'm going to include in the weight model, so these are the, the variables W that I mentioned earlier, I'm going to include sex, years of education, so my exposure, income, my outcome, age, days of physical activity per week as a proxy for health, and then I'm also going to include an interaction term between education and income. And for the sensitivity parameters, I'm going to uh, choose values that imply the average individual in the sample has between a 2% and 20% probability of being sampled. And each standard deviation, in, uh, standard deviation increase in each variable could change the conditional odds of sample selection between one third and three. Um, okay. So from here, these are the uh, parameters, that I, these are the sensitivity parameters that I picked. And what we want to do now is add some constraints. So you'll, you'll see in the next slide that if I just go ahead with these parameters, the sensitivity analysis is pretty conservative. You know, it's quite wide. Um, but I know some information about the, the UK population. Um, so I want to add that in. So the first thing that I know is the response rate of UK Biobank. I know that's 5.5%. Um, I, I know the proportion of males in the UK population within this the UK Biobank age range uh, is about 49.5%. The proportion of UK households earning more than £31,000 a year was 21% back in 2006 when UK Biobank recruitment was taking place, or it was between 2006 and 2010, but I, I picked the value in 2006. Um, and then I know the average age of individuals within this two-year age bracket is, is basically 49, so the, the midpoint. And I, I got all these, these statistics from the ONS. So what I can do, I have this figure here. So on the, uh, the very bottom, this is the sensitivity analysis without any constraints in red. Um, and we can see that you know, the, the interval is quite wide. And, and in particular, both the exposure and the outcome are binary. So this, this interval, because I, I use a linear regression, th this interval is actually uh, pushing beyond the, the sort of permissible values of the effect. Um, and I, I use a linear regression just, just to replicate what the original paper did. So the, the, point, the point estimate here is in pink, and this is sort of positive. Uh, the confidence interval doesn't contain zero. Uh, and and you know, this, this big red interval basically means that I, I'm not able to say anything about the effect, which is kind of undesirable. Um, and what, as I move up the graph, I'm adding each of these constraints sequentially. So in yellow, I'm adding the response rate constraint, uh, in green, the uh, proportion of males, then uh, income, and then finally age. And by the time I've added the final constraint, uh, I get something that's, you know, it's quite a bit wider than the original estimate but I can rule out the null um, and it seems to be sort of somewhat plausible. It's, it's positive, it, it's suggesting maybe the effect could be a bit lower than what I estimated, um, could, could possibly be, be a bit bigger. The, the confidence interval for the upper bound is quite wide. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's kind of, so th this is sort of what you would report. And I, I guess I should mention that the thicker lines here, these are the, the estimated intervals themselves. So this is, you know, on, on the left uh, would be the, the estimated infimum and the right would be the estimated supremum. And then the thinner lines are this, these confidence intervals that we construct. Uh, yeah, so that's, so th we have this figure in the paper. This is the UK Biobank example. And I think what's, what's sort of, uh, sort of nice about this is that we can include things uh, sort of above balancing weighting is we can include things like interactions or sort of nonlinear terms, which I think in certain cases could be quite important. 
Um, I, I think having an interaction between education and income in, in the weight model was probably a good thing to have here. Uh, so I'll, I'll round off with the COVID-19 example. So this was, this one's included in a paper that we published in, um, in Nature Communications last year on collider bias in COVID-19 studies. Uh, we, we have a little like an, an online tutorial for applying certain weighting methods and uh, this, what, what I describe here is sort of in that. So what, what we wanted, and this is completely just an illustrative example, but I'm, I'm considering what, what we want to do is estimate whether certain traits, uh, we have three that we considered, sex, age, and BMI, whether these are associated with a heightened risk of COVID-19 infection. And the, the issue is that we can only estimate these associations in individuals who received a COVID-19 test. And it's, it's a high likelihood that people who are positive for COVID would go, th these tests were taken back in 2020, I think it was May 2020. The people who were positive for COVID were likely to seek out a test. So that's going to increase their likelihood of being tested. And we were also screening a lot more heavily for certain characteristics, in particular things like age. So, you know, older people were probably also more likely to be tested. We had limited testing capacity. So what, what we're concerned with is that spurious associations with COVID-19 infection might be introduced if we only, if we restrict ourselves to individuals who have been tested, certainly back then. Um, so what we use here is a UK Biobank subsample of individuals with a COVID-19 test result positive or negative, as I mentioned, from around May 2020. And I'm going to include in the weight model um, age, sex, BMI, the test results, so positive or negative, square of age and BMI, and an interaction between age and test results. Uh, for the sensitivity parameters, I'm going, to I'm going to pick values that imply that the average individual in the sample has between a 1% and 50% probability of being tested. So this is quite wide. Um, and then same as the last one, uh, each standard deviation increase in, uh, or standard deviation increase in each variable can change conditional odds of sample selection between one third and three. Um, in terms of auxiliary constraints, because I have, again, this was an illustrative example, I have the full UK Biobank data set that this was sampled from. Um, so I can choose the response rate of the tested subsample as a constraint, as well as average age, sex, and BMI in the full UK Biobank sample. Um, and I can also, I can modify the parameter space quite easily to ensure that being positive for COVID will always increase one's likelihood of being tested. So I, I don't want to consider weights where being positive for COVID reduces your probability of being tested. Um, so for the association between age and COVID-19 infection, we have a plot that looks a little bit like this. So the first two uh, confidence intervals up at the top here. These are the kind of directly. Uh, these are these are direct estimates. So the blue one is the raw association between age and in COVID nineteen infection in this tested subsample. And what we also do is estimate inverse probability weights. Um, obviously, these these inverse probability weights. I can't include um, the whether somebody tested positive or not, because I don't observe that in the full UK Biobank sample. So these, these inverse probability weights basically include all the baseline demographic variables. So they include age, sex, BMI, some higher order terms. Um, and what's interesting here is that, you know, the, the IPW estimates really don't differ all that much from the raw estimates. And probably what, what's going on here is that, you know, we're, we are missing the the key variable here, which is the outcome. We, we really need to be including whether somebody was actually positive for COVID-19 in this weight model, because that's likely the single biggest driver of selection. And it's also our outcome. So if, if we're concerned about something like collider bias, where the outcome and the exposure both cause selection and that introduces some spurious association, then omitting the outcome from the weight model is we're sort of artificially assuming that that isn't happening. So once we uh, sort of move to the bottom two intervals, this is the sensitivity analysis I was talking about. The red one at the bottom doesn't include any constraints. 
uh, and it's very large. Um, it basically tells us that I, I, I should mention that in terms of the scale of these effects, these have been standardized. So this is a, this is in terms of a standard deviation increase in age uh, on the probability of testing positive. So these are very large effects, um, and they're it's difficult to really conclude anything about them. I, I zoomed in on the figure because the, the red line goes all the way off to the right. Once we've included the constraints, uh, we, it's, we, we have a slightly more precise picture. It's still quite wide. Um, and what it's suggesting really is that the effect or the association could be quite a bit more positive than the unconditional, than the sort of unweighted or naively weighted estimates. And that sort of makes sense if we think that age increases your likelihood of being tested and being positive for COVID increases your likelihood of being tested in an additive way, then condition, then stratifying by test result is should uh, typically downward bias that association. So the, the interval suggesting that the effect could be a bit more positive and, and even it's more likely that older people were positive for COVID, that's so I think that sort of makes sense. We, we might expect that. Um, we can also do this with BMI. Uh, and what's interesting here is that the, the, the uh, constraints don't tighten the interval as much as with age. So we, we actually still have quite a lot of uncertainty about the, the association between BMI and COVID-19 infection. Sort of suggests that it's likely to be positive, but of course the interval does overlap with zero in this case. Um, one, one thing that you know, would probably make this a little bit more informative if we could get our hands on is something like the uh, ONS um, sort of ra random testing, the, the sort of prevalence estimates. I, I expect that if we included that as a constraint, we, we'd probably tighten this quite a bit. Um, but yeah, so, so these are the two uh, yeah, two examples for risk factors for COVID-19. And that, that's really all I have. Um, in terms of, you know, concluding remarks, we, we do have a preprint that's available on archive. It's been up there for a while, but this paper has changed uh, quite a lot since then. Um, I also put an R package out quite recently that implements uh, everything that I just described. And the paper should hopefully be out soon. Uh, just on the final couple hurdles with it. Um, and yeah, definitely hu huge thanks to my co-authors who helped a lot with this. And, and in particular, uh, editors and reviewers at Biometrica who, who were really, really thorough. And I think, I think the paper's much better as a result. Um, but yeah, and then there's, I've got a few references as well. So that's, that's everything from me. Right, thank you very much, Matt. Um, okay. So do we have any questions? Arnab wanted to ask a question. I'll see if I can unmute. Um, ask to unmute, what does that mean, ask to unmute? Oh, maybe that means, maybe that means you unmute, Arnab. Yeah, um, so first of all, uh, it's a very interesting paper and I enjoyed listening to Matt. Uh, my, I have just one question on uh, the assumption that you were making that uh, you initially begin with uh, an, a random sample of size capital M from an infinite population. Now yeah. that may be difficult to do uh, in many surveys uh, uh, because in many surveys, even the sampling frame, particularly like web surveys, your sampling frame may not be available. Uh, so. Uh, my question is, how sensitive are your results to this particular assumption? Um, yes, yeah, so th I, I would think I think of this more as kind of a technical assumption, just for for being able to define the probability weights, ha having sort of well-defined probability weights. We we certainly don't need to know what this capital N is. Um, it's it's really just it it's it's an idea that we have some we basically have a set of individuals who could enter our sample, some of whom do and some of whom don't. Um, and the weights are defined with, with respect to, you know, it, it, it's a comparison of those who select versus those who, who don't. Um, but yeah, we don't, we don't need to really know anything about what this, 
this sample size n is. Um, it, it's sort of, we, we get a sense of it from, for example, if, if I know, in the case of UK Biobank, if, if I know the response rate of UK Biobank, um, because, you know, however many people had been sent invitations, then I can't, I do have a sense of what uh, n is, but that isn't, it, it isn't necessary. I, I don't have to know the response rate. I don't have to know anything about this sort of hypothetical super sample in order to, to run the analysis. Uh, does that does that make sense? Yeah, I understand. What you're okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No worries. Okay, anyone else? Okay, I I'll ask a question. Um, oh, I, I do see someone with their hand up. Oh, do you? Yeah. Oh, yes. Ashish, 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 go ahead. Oh yeah, thanks. Uh, that was a fantastic talk. Um, so one question I had was, uh, I was just wondering if your constraint sets um, can incorporate monotonicity constraints. Um, so for example, you might believe that the probability of selection is increasing or decreasing in one variable. Uh, is that something you've looked at or do you think that would considerably tighten the bounds? Um, it's not something that I've, that I looked at in this paper, but so, so uh, I, I mean, I, I guess the kind of, the, the, we kind of, by setting up, you know, this, uh, this weight model, um, at, least, at least in this sensitivity analysis, I guess we kind of assume, we can assume monotonicity uh, by, you know, I, I, I not including a, a higher order term for a, for a particular variable, uh, or or do you, do you mean that I I I know the the direction of the the effect of a particular variable that I want? Well, to yeah, something like if yeah, some sort okay. of substantive assumption on something like that. Um, um, yeah, so I I do consider that in the paper. So we call that a direction. We call that a direction constraint, um, and it, you know I I might know as you say, maybe maybe some variable like with the uh, COVID-19 test result, I know that that should certainly increase my probability of being tested. So I, I only want to consider weights which imply that that is, that is strictly positive. Um, and that's, that's really easy to do because that just involves modifying the parameter space a little bit. Uh, I don't even need to formulate that as, as like a, a sample constraint. Um, so yeah, we, we do consider that. There, there are some, in, in the paper, we also generalized a non-parametric sensitivity analysis in Aronoff and Lee, uh, the, the Aronoff and Lee paper. Um, so they, they don't have an explicit functional form for the weights like this. And in that case, including a monotonicity constraint, I think might be a bit more involved, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, it could be, yeah, it, it could bring quite a lot of information, I think. It'd be interesting to look at. Yeah. Great, thanks. No worries. Anyone else? Okay. Um, I was wondering about situations where you might want to assume that the uh, that your your Q of theta, the thing that you're trying to estimate. Is uh, is a parameter in a say a, a simple linear regression model, and you want it like uh, a linear regression of y on x, so it's just the slope, and you you want to assume for some reason that you you really believe that this is a linear relationship between y and x. So if selection depended on x and y. No, supposing selection only depends on x, then you don't need any weights to estimate this slope. Okay, because uh, uh, remember selection only depends on x, the model is assumed to be correct, so no matter, even if you're even if your sample is, is not representative of the population, you would still be able to consistently estimate the slope in this unrepresentative population. 
And so in that situation, you, you wouldn't want to use any of your method um, when you are assuming that selection only depends on X because you don't need it. Um, the selection is not causing any sort of bias in this slope, estimated slope. But supposing that you, uh, you believe that it depended on X and Y, selection depends on X and Y, and so maybe you want to use, somebody wants to use your method, but they want to assume that this linear regression is correctly specified model. Is your method doesn't doesn't any anywhere assume that this is a correctly specified linear regression model? Is it possible for you to to, to incorporate that assumption somehow into your method? Huh, uh, that's really interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. What we have up to this point doesn't it doesn't require a model for the estimator in any way. Um, I, I, off the top of my head, I, I don't, I can't think of what exactly that constraint would look like, but in, in principle, I mean, it so sounds like something that would constrain the, the these relationships a bit. Uh, it, yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. Point. I have to reflect on it a bit because I'm just thinking that in, in yeah in your case, if you believe that selection only depended on x, not on y, mm. so you don't need to use your method. But if you did use your correct, method, yeah. uh, then it and you said that selection could depend quite heavily on x, then your confidence intervals would be quite wide. Um, because you know, they they would allow. No, it, it, because it's it's possible that the correct weight for somebody could be very very large because that person has an outlying x value mm -hmm. uh, and so you get very wide confidence intervals but you didn't need to get very wide in confidence intervals because you could have just fitted the model the linear regression model without any weights at all that that's so that's just my thinking for why i asked that question Okay. Yeah, no, that sounds interesting. I mean, yeah, because I guess you could, I mean, you could take the uh, the slope estimate, sort of in, input the linear regression, you know, in, input a, a linear model and maybe see if it would simplify to something that, uh, you know, I, I, yeah, it'd be interesting to think about. But I think I, I, I see your point. Uh, yeah, you, you would be, if, if you truly believe the linear model was correct, then you would be over conservative by, I guess, not using that information in the uh, in in the optimization problem. Of course, you might not want to assume that it's a correct. You might not. <laughs> yeah, but maybe in some cases you might. Any anyone else? Okay then. Right. Well, I, I will finish it there. Thank you very much indeed, Matt, for a very interesting talk. Thanks very much for having me.